Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homeless Perspective. This is Hamza, and I am so excited to speak with our guest today. I would like to call him the Tiger Woods of public speaking. And the reason why I say that, and he's laughing, is I think one of his first words was actually a speech. And he was raised in the church very young, and that's where he got his head start in public speaking. It led him to win all types of awards, state recognition from third grade on, and that continued on to his adult life. He is currently a podcaster. He's an author. He's a certified leadership trainer with the John Maxwell team. He is in the DMZ out of Baltimore. He's done numerous speaking engagements, and his books that he's written is Going North, Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself. He also has written Stay the Course, The Elite Performers, Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success, and he's a contributing author to the upcoming book, From Crappy to Happy, Sacred Stories of Transformational Joy that's coming out this fall, all of this audience before the age of 30. So you guys think that you are pushing the pedal to the metal? I think that there might be a comeuppance, and he may give you some little nuggets that we're going to cover in this next hour. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dominique Dom Brightman. Welcome, Dom. My man, how's it, dude? Like, man, you are phenomenal, man. The Tiger Woods is public secret. Like, I am so keeping that because someone else said it and not me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Hey, respect the words, dude, man. I mean, you've, you've done a lot in what would consider a small period of time. And, I mean, it just, I just feel it's, it, the intrinsic motivation, if I may, <laughs> of a long path that you have. I, I think that you're just getting started. You are already getting the recognition. So, you know, kudos to you. Hey, just just got to make a name for myself and at least do some good while I'm in this song on this planet. <laughs> good point. Actually, and we didn't plan this, but that's actually my first question because – when I was driving around today and give a shout out to Chick-fil-A since they have a headquarters here, I'm driving by Chick-fil-A. There's a line around the corner in the drive through right? And then there's a mom and pop chicken store restaurant right next door. They also sell chicken, but there's not any line, not like Chick-fil-A for sure. And you're a, a certified leadership trainer with John Maxwell, with the John Maxwell team. And I was wondering, was it the branding with the John Maxwell team versus Dominique Don Brightman leadership trainer? <laughs> Man, uh, well, the branding, well, for one, the obvious <laughs> the six between the two is one's close to the chocolate side of the game and one's closer to the white chocolate side of the game. If you're doing a color section mm. <laughs> in terms of the branding. Ah. And and I get that. And it's really interesting that we're having this conversation today because or and what I mean by today is twenty twenty. So much has happened and there's been things, you know, prior to 2020 that's been around, but I think it's to the forefront now. And there's a lot of reconciliation that's happening. And especially in your area, I mean, it depends on where the DMV you are. You're either a Washington Redskins fan or a Ravens fan. And Washington's going through their own identity branding at this, at this point. You know, so do you think that the chocolate side versus the vanilla uh, plays a part in 2020? Oh, yeah, it definitely plays a huge part. Oh, is that a record? Nope, I'm still here, man. Oh, okay, cool. Good. Good. Just ran back in the line. <laughs> But yes, yes, yeah, yeah, so basically, when it comes to the branding piece, it's not only just a, just a face value of the state, but also the fact that it's also a difference in experience as well as just time on the planet. Because my man Maxwell, he is a really good 74 at the time of this recording, and he's in a stride, and he's at 
hundreds of hours of your time mm-hmm. just really getting himself out there and preaching and leading, and he's built his life around his one word of leadership. As opposed to myself, I've got certified under him, and it's really just an honor to be one of his legacy legs because his writings have changed my life, and I've still got plenty of decades to come if I'm allowed to continue to live on the planet as long as I can. Mm-hmm. And there's no telling how far I'm able to go, depending on how focused I stay and how long I get to keep some metaphorical fuel in the tank to keep going. So, in terms of the comparison, the one of the branding pieces is the guy who's been doing this for decades on end and the guy who's really just a teammate, to be honest, because he likes to say that, hey, I'm John and I'm your friend. Mm-hmm. And I believe it because I met him through his words, through his written word, before actually hearing the man speak. And he prefers to have friends as opposed to fans because fans, they idolize you and it's a different relationship as opposed to a friend where it's an equal quality field and you're looking to help out one another. Mm-hmm. So it's really more about the collaboration piece and using his name to add on to what I'm doing to better society as opposed to trying to compete with somebody when there's no need to compete because there's enough of this pie in the world for everyone. Mm-hmm. And it's a huge pie. It's a huge pie. It doesn't matter what color or creed or background. If you have the abundance mentality and you take the appropriate action to make it happen, then it won't matter. Now, granted, there's still people that are still going to see the same color first before you create everything else. But still, folks of multiple colors and creeds have achieved success. They've attained success because they took the right action and they had the right mindset as well as the right heart set to really make whatever they wanted to happen, happen. And they manifested it because they didn't let skin color be something that set themselves back. They used that and everything else to set them forward. And and thanks for the clarification because if we are comparing scarcity versus the abundance mentality and you have your choice of which clients you want to deal with, you definitely want to deal with the abundance mentality versus the latter. And it just seems like an overall win-win without any hang-ups from the gate. Oh, heck yeah, man. Especially if you're trying to really get some of the slides to five minute four. They kind of like with affiliate marketing. It's like when you combine two audiences together, like even with this, a podcast, I was getting another podcast, so it's a good old time, more behind the mic, goodness, sharing an experience of just learning and listening, and everybody else gets to hear. Some of my others get to come to your show and vice versa. And then as you go on and you keep going, you notice how this is really the era, the era of cyber closeness because mm-hmm. with physical distancing in the quote unquote social distancing with the COVID crap going on that's been taking lives and business and livelihoods, it's been forcing people to focus more on cyber closeness. And as you continue to go on and build yourself a brand, especially online, especially if you're focusing a lot on what you want to attract to your life, you're going to start seeing a lot of people over and over again, and you're going to be across all the way and it was got a gal steward. Mm-hmm. And it's like, wow, it's awesome. Uh, so there's no time that's better than the present moment. And you definitely encapsulated that and, and what you're talking about with the cyber closeness. And with the physical closeness, I do see throughout throughout the country, uh, like in California, there was some opening up a couple of months ago around Memorial Day and what have you. And now they're closing back up. And I see that in, in Maryland, that indoor dining is about to uh go back, they're going to get rid of it for the time being. They're going to suspend indoor dining by the end of the week. And there's mandates for uh, indoor face masks as well. What's it like on the ground in uh, in Maryland for you right now? Yeah, so we're definitely right. My man says Kurt. And it's all because of people not wanting to wear the mask. And I can understand why, because I got glasses. It's uncomfortable to wear a mask, especially when conversation kicks in and your eyes fog up and you feel like, man, is this like Naruto season one and Zabba's going to come out of nowhere and sad me because I can't see nothing? And truth be told, yeah, the COVID is still wreaking havoc because we still have to 
at least deal with a little un, uncomfortable situation to get back to a point where we can have a better reality again. Because one thing that a lot of folks were saying as a buzzword for a few for a couple months is the new normal. And to be honest, it's really a new reality because <laughs> 2020 normal is basically being able to sit indoors without a mask. And the 2019 normal, you can sit inside and outside with no mask, worrying about no gun virus. So, yeah, the ground has been very interesting. And, yes, it kind of sucks that we've been having to recede and go back a bit because we're making so much progress. But it's just for the safety and for the good of the people. It's like, hey, just wear the darn mask and go inside and get your groceries or whatever, and just really have to just cook it home or take the food home. Heck, like even with some lottery systems, like they've been doing curbside pickup and they haven't run people back in yet, and some people have been trying to foam at the mouth, trying to open the door, because <laughs> they want that PC and get that Wi-Fi time to try to block for a job or something. So that's really what it's been like. It's, it's been a lot of folks, especially in the field, just firing their butts off and us having to take off the whole like the the whole indoor dining thing after the seat of back a day, bring it back a bit and now hopefully folks will get the message now and hopefully we can get back to making progress so that way we don't have to be like little kids getting grounded again. <laughs> Not be able to go outside and play with our friends but All right, absolutely. And I didn't bring this up at the at the introduction, but you do help individuals with their resumes and you said that the new normal is the new reality. So what is the new reality like as a certified leadership coach? And also, what is it like for working with folks to complete a new resume since there's so many people that are looking for work? Yeah, funny enough, the resume help that hasn't been a huge thing for me since basically that was with the library gig is the daytime job mostly. But that has just been taking phone calls and helping folks out, but basically finding books or whatever. So the resume, the statistics and the things, everything that is the same. And a lot of career coaches are helping out people in that regard, too, because even though COVID's happening, if you're able to pick up some digital skills, then you'll be able to set yourself apart. And that's one of the biggest things that's been happening now is that a lot of folks have been having to set their game up, like for those who've been doing Zoom and Skype and all that other stuff for a while, they had to really get better at it and help out and train those who are not familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Because there's already a digital divide with a lot of places, mm-hmm. and that's even with senior citizens. But now it's like, well, you ain't got no choice. <laughs> you ain't got no good Wi-Fi, and you're not sure how to use a computer or use Zoom and hop on a Zoom call, then you're basically screwed. Like myself, I, Zoom was my friend before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as the pandemic hit and everybody was home using the residential Wi-Fi and everybody's on Zoom crashing the servers, it's been hell for me. And I had to, for a while, call in using my phone while using my laptop camera mm. for a stream for that way if someone needs to see my face, they'll be able to do that. Mm. And just really forcing people to skill up even more has been the main yeah. thing. And that's it's really the main thing, thing. thing. Just, just forcing people, people to skill, skill up. up. Mm-hmm. And you had mentioned the digital divide and you mentioned uh, different different uh, demographics. And one other thing with with the virus and everything that's happening is the disparity with uh, p- the poor populations or people of color, uh, black people included. And do you think that bridging the digital divide is something easier to get through um, and then it'll help as far as bringing in an awareness as to maintaining health, and then ultimately being your best self? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. definitely. Because, I mean, with the whole digital bot thing, with forced people to scale up, like, I don't know if a buddy of mine, he actually makes friends with a lot of people, and they got him hooked up with zero and all sorts of stuff on his phone, because when I helped him out when this whole pandemic started, he had a brand new smartphone, but the darn Outlook app wouldn't work. But a few weeks in... He got his computer up there with Windows 10, got his smartphone with the Outlook app with no 
on the issues, and he was able to get Zoom on both the phone and his computer. So that's another thing, too. It's like make friends with people and be friendly towards people and get to have some darn good friends because we all need friends. We're all human. Mm-hmm. So it's even though we can't physically be too close to each other in terms of like like partnerships with other people, we can still be close to other wise and still make friends with other people because that's really kind of like going back to the collaboration piece of what we all need because like my buddy, he's made so many friends over the years and helped them out with food and whatnot where it's like, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to need some help. Help out the dog. And it's like, yeah, they help them out. So advance others to advance yourself, man. It's like you, you just got to have friends out here and be good to people because if you're not, you're basically <laughs> going to be up so well. <laughs> Yeah, I know you're right. I mean, just like if you even think about for intrinsic motivation or your podcast, I mean, we get access to people globally that have similar mindsets. And from an outsider, if it's new to them, I think that's why I'm really excited speaking with you because you're, I mean, you're younger than our usual people that we speak with and you're ahead of the game. So it's like, Wow, it's one of those, I wish I could could have done it when I was that age where the technology wasn't around, but you're definitely positioning yourself to be a thought leader, and I think people ultimately defer to you when the next thing comes about, right? Because you're probably one of those bleeding edge people that will do all of the beta testing before it gets mass production. Somewhat, somewhat. I'm not a fan of Windows 10. I mean, I, I finally got a Windows 10 laptop like two weeks ago. I was using <laughs> Windows 8 for years on end. <laughs> While well, I was still working before the updates happened. So I like to stay abreast of situations, but I'm not always a fan of testing out the bugs and whatnot. I, I'm, it's kind of like the whole second wave of a smartphone or an iPhone as opposed to being one of the first people in line camping out waiting to get one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's not going to be happening anytime soon anymore. Mm, yeah, they're right. If it's something you tell your grandkids, they won't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly. It's like, man, everybody was covered with masks and whatnot. And heck, even the, the folks, uh, the Muslim women, they already had the game because they already had the head wraps and everything. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, this is not new for us. <laughs> Sure, sure. Uh, I wanted to ask you a, a music question. I wanted to know if you are familiar with, I'm sure you're familiar with Where I Am from the Black Eyed Peas, but are you also familiar with Lion Leslie? Uh, the name sounds familiar. I probably heard a couple songs that I didn't know was him on the song. Sure. And the reason why I bring it up and to bring it up for, for your edification is those two gentlemen started out in music for the most part. But these guys are industry titans in technology and just leading the way. And uh, I'm sure you're probably like this too where you're talking about making friends with people. These guys are saying they're, weren't, they're in circles where a lot of us aren't represented and they're bringing that information back and sharing uh, what they're learning. And so collectively, I think they're giving us a leg up and they're bridging in a digital divide. Amen to that, dude. Amen to that. Because that's what we need. Because being able to have crossover appeal is a major thing. Because it's like, yeah, the whole floor is by us. I love it. Black, black dollars with that back where it belongs. Like, yeah, let's keep it in our communities. But also making sure to also collaborate with other folks and actually learn from other people. Because you're not going to get far in life relying on just one entire group of people. It, it, it's kind of like a millionaire, the rapper, mm-hmm. and his impact area interview, which is an uh, interview I definitely want people to check out if, if you ever heard of a millionaire. Like, like, dude had just one hit song, like, Loud and Dirty, and people thought it was a one hit wonder, but dude was actually moving through so many groups, and when he explained his rapper name, being mini chameleon, as he'd be able to get in so many rooms and take some of the dodge and bring it back to his community, we're going to have to be able to do that ourselves and continue to do that because the more you know and apply, the better you'll do in life because we can know all day. I mean, we got folks that claim they know everything in the world. They probably got like their fifth eye open because they got a pair of glasses with a third eye <laughs> and they can see pyramids and UFOs and whatnot. <laughs> They're like, hey, if, that's, if, if you can do that, that's cool. So uh, what, what are we going to do about it, though? It's like uh, 
So the UFOs come in, can they help us start this business where we can sell, sell toy UFOs so that way when they come, they can be like, hey, that kind of space looks more kind of familiar but smaller. Like, you know, like can we do something with that? No, that's what, thanks for bringing it up, Camille, you know, because I, I would definitely put him up there with Ryan Leslie and Will I Am. Uh, the other person I would put up there that many people don't know about is MC Hammer. And Camille here was one of the few people that was talking about MC Hammer as a life lesson because most people know him as the rapper in the early 90s and then the guy that had millions and then went broke. And he's one of the quiet owners of, of Twitter and He's very heavily uh, involved in the tech space. And so it, it's one thing of, of changing the, the dynamic, right? Like you're, if we think, you know, people, your pants are shagging and this type of deal, even to millionaire, like when he's, people approach him on the street would think that not knowing his uh, promise to be a chameleon in all these different environments. Heck yeah, man. Like, dude, it's, we need people like that. And it's actually good that people sometimes get part of the story because some people aren't ready for the whole story. And if they get the whole story, they may try to become a leech and ruin the whole story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, man. That's why I brought up Z Hammer, you know, because I think that in some communities, the flashier are you're bringing more attention to yourself. And like you said, people can reach off of what they're already thinking or thinking what you're not even putting out there. So you, in some ways, become a target. If you're not a Canadian, you're not blending in. If you're standing out, um, that might not be your best position. So, heck yeah, man. One thing I wanted to ask you, uh, as, we, as we're talking some technology and become just getting a word out there and syndication and, and bridging the world, if you will. Um, there is the community, there is the talk now that uh, with once upon a time, if you were networking, you would hand out a business card. And more and more people are, instead of a business card, people are more and more per, uh, promoting their books. And so that's kind of the new business card. And you've been ahead of that game for years. You're on the third book. What was it like getting set up for the right, for the first book, what type of objections did you have to overcome or obstacles rather? Uh, the first book, man, that was powerful because funny enough, the book was written on a dare. Mm-hmm. Funny enough from a lady at a Toastmasters conference where we was all about personal development and inspiration and, and motivation, all that good stuff. And the book stemmed from this reading list that actually was, a variation of a business card called the 100 Books of Dynamic Living. And that was kind of like the business card I was giving out to people because my contact info was on the bottom of the list. Because people give out business cards all the time. It's pretty COVID. And some people have graveyards of business cards. <laughs> like a stack of them. Stack of them. And I... I still have a business card myself, but I actually took my past advice on it and made sure my face is on it because people get so many cards and some people treat them like a cookie mug game and try to collect them all. Then <laughs> when they get home, they put it in their little plastic container and business card and graveyard, card, and then they probably go through them the following day, the following week, or five years in the future, and you're like, who the heck is this? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> basically, if you're going to have a business card, make sure it has your face on it, if people are still accept it, and try to make sure it's creative. And as for the book as a business card, especially if sharing it with fellow authors, it gives you an edge, and it also helps people out. Because funny enough, one guy gave it to, he was like, man, thanks, dude. I needed something to read on my flight back to Atlanta, Georgia. This was a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And folks are funny enough call me back months later. Like, when I traded books with this one lady, funny enough, she's in Baltimore City, Denise Folks. She actually asked me if I did trains for, like, little kids. And I'm like, oh, shoot, why not? Yeah. And a few months later, I was actually asked to be a guest speaker at a Martin Luther King Day breakfast because of, that time, just doing a little book exchange and just having a short conversation and helping out, and she actually gave me pretty darn good honorary. Such an early speaker at the time, so 
Yeah, yeah man, books are definitely a more high end business card because a book, people can throw them away, but they're not. Because at the end of the day, a book is something you're going to read or you keep on your bookshelf, and you're going to go back to it. And a book can go where you can't. Like, people reading backwards, and I'm guilty of that, that's why I said it, because, like, like you're going to go in the bathroom with somebody, if you're normal, that is. Like, if, if someone can actually have their thoughts, have your thoughts in their hands, reading, but the rest of the moment, and heck, even heard one preacher mention how he likes to write books to argue his point without arguing. Mm-hmm. Because if you read someone's book, and whether you disagree with it or not, you still heard their end of the story, and they didn't have to waste their breath in the way. And not to mention, it's a piece of immortality because a book will be here long after you're gone. Uh-huh. So that's really just a little piece of what happened with the first book. It was written on a dare based off of a book list because I liked reading a lot of books, and they felt me. And to also differentiate myself from a lot of other people because in this era of attention management, you got to get above the noise and everything that's vying for your attention, whether it's through TV, if you still watch TV, social media, soaring through the phone, and all these ads popping in out of nowhere trying to sell you something because they're like, hey, you know you're not watching TV as much anymore, buddy. I think you're on the YouTube TV. Let's see if you like this ad, buddy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got a $97 program for you. Change your life. <laughs> You, you bring a really good point about the ad space because I think it was today or yesterday, the new, every day in 2020, right? It's like, what else are we going to hear? Well, for the first time since the 60s, when it started, regular fall programming is not going to happen this year. And the fall programming for your favorite TV shows is all about advertising so they can advertise the new cars and such while you're watching Leave it to Beaver. This is the first time that it's not going to happen. And so there may be that digital wave continuing to go to your digital landscape since people will not be watching TV. Yeah, man. We got to run the more commercials now. Yeah, everybody everybody got to watch reruns. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on that note, with Going North, which is your first book, Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself, what was the biggest takeaway? I know it was a dare, but what were some of the techniques that you were using to advance yourself? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, some, some of the techniques. Some of the techniques. Uh, one, one of them is actually a mindset technique that I like to call lack of customer service. And somebody might be thinking, what the hell is this? Falling up in <laughs> at my first of a book signing at my at my church old lady like, wait a second, I like this customer service. What? <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably having flashbacks at that at that one time we got a rookie or heck even a Karen doing a chair from the other side of the spectrum and we have to manage But it it's it's nothing deal with just that in terms of being a great customer service professional, but also deal with the mindset of advancing others to self. Because they're, in the book, I mentioned Magic Johnson because he actually was starting his entrepreneurial journey, investing in real estate, and he's going to have this meeting with his hard-nosed negotiator. And he made sure that he showed up early because this guy was known for being sick for a long time. And... When he finally met the guy, they had a conversation in their office. As the conversation went along, the guy that he was negotiation, negotiating with, my man, he was actually asked him about a basketball game that happened in Magic Johnson's early career, as far as rookie year. And there was a moment where this one kid wanted to take a picture or was have an autograph from one of Magic's teammates. And the teammate didn't feel like talking with the kid or signing his page of photograph or whatever. And as the kid was about to cry, Magic came over, smiled, he took a picture with the kid, signed, his, he gave him an autograph, and he turned his smile upside down and made him happy. And that kid later became a successful lawyer. Mm-hmm. And that kid was the son of the negotiator that Magic was meeting with. Mm-hmm. So Magic was decades early because he saw a little kid and he tried to make their day feel better and inspire him 
not knowing that 20 years later he was going to be meeting that kid's father to negotiate with, and the father gave him a deal right then. So just having that mindset of being good to people and treating them right and making sure that not only treat them right, always treat yourself right too because you never know. It's like you never know who you'll need in this lifetime. Life is long and short because it's short because it's so fragile and we can die any day. But it's also long because if you do something you hate for so long, it eats away at your inner being, your soul. And 10 years will pass, you'd be like, God dang. I'm like, why the heck am I 40? Like, yesterday I just got out of college. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Absolutely. And, and thanks for sharing that with, with Michael, I mean, I'm sorry, with Magic Johnson, because uh, you were talking earlier about making friends with people. And that brings me to my next question, and I'll stay with Magic Johnson, because they asked him a couple of years ago about Starbucks. And as an athlete, a, a lot of athletes, uh, when new companies are coming out with, start, uh, with uh, startups, you know, they like to get that familiar face and what have you. And they approached him about ownership into Starbucks. And he said, eh, yeah, I don't you know nobody's going to pay $5 for coffee. Well, right? it's kind of funny now, but... And then the other one that I can think of is James Earl Jones. He was a, uh, an actor doing many movies, but when he did uh, Star Wars, it was such a, a small role for him. He didn't even get paid. He didn't think it was that important to get paid in Star Wars. Again, sounds really funny. And my question to you, because it sounds like you're, you're, you're rubbing shoulders and you're, you're either you've learned or you're continuing to learn to rub shoulders with um people that are outside your comfort zone. So my question is, how are you able to identify if opportunities are always around you? There's some people that would say, oh, you're lucky. But I think it, it has to do with the mindset and the picker. So I want to get your take on that. Sure thing. And funny enough, I had this people kind of, that question actually reminds me of a Dame Dash interview where he mentioned how some people, it takes seven times for them to get something, kind of like the whole marketing and advertising thing. Very few people get it right the first time. Mm-hmm. So those out there, they're kind of lucky. They're not always lucky. They were just more aware, and they may have jumped on an opportunity quicker than your average person because they had that awareness. Now, I do believe in good luck, and luck does exist because I'm a spiritual person, and we're all spiritual beings inside of a human body, so <laughs> it's just no spiritual thing right there. But, for the, but the thing is, like when it comes to people and being able to metaphorically rub shoulders with them, is just being open to that and realizing that no matter how much accomplishment someone has, they are just, just like you and me, just, just like you and I. They, they all have to go to the bathroom. We all have to die one day. We're all mortal beings. And no matter how many things you accomplish, we come in the world through the, through the same way, and we all have to go out the same way. And we're all going to die one day. We're all mortal, and everybody just wants to feel important and contribute to society. So. Having that mindset of realizing that no matter how many things someone's accomplished, there's still a human like you and I, and also realizing that sometimes opportunity will come and that you may not realize the first time, because funny enough, there's this guy by the name of Bobby Herrera, and he wrote this wonderful book called The Gift of Struggle. And in the back of his book, she was like, hey, reach out to me and share some good stories and all that good stuff. And I, was, I just put it aside for a moment. I'm like, you know what? I thought, like, you know, maybe I should get him on a podcast. That's my podcast is all about interviewing authors. And I was like, you know what? I got a must work of material. I'll, I'll, I'll probably wait. I think I'll be all right. <laughs> and that waiting, even though it would have happened anyway, funny enough, nine months later after finishing his book, I get a pitch from one of his media reps for his company, the Populous Group, asking to be on my show. And I'm like, oh, what the fuck? Like, dude. <laughs> I, I should have asked earlier. Mm. And that just goes to the fact that, like, hey, like some, sometimes when it comes to making that reach out there, 
is going to take advantage because whatever is meant to happen is going to be meant to happen. Whatever is said most times is meant to be what's said. He got on my show. I could have had him on last year, but he still was meant to be on the show this year. We had one heck of a good conversation. And heck, maybe even with the timing piece, like we have to also realize that our timing in our mind may not be the timing of God or the universe because funny enough, the whole John Maxwell team certification, that goal of mine, I was supposed to be in around 2017, but it didn't happen until last year because my father, I lost him to dementia in 2017 mm. and that goal fell behind the wayside. And I waited a couple of years and I actually got more of a bundle seal of the deal getting a disc certification to be able to assist behavior and help out companies and people to be able to take the disc test certification and assist behavior. And you know, almost Adam, two years later, and you know, the deal, and probably sitting a good, <laughs> I'm probably sitting a good four grand too with the whole opportunity, with the whole waiting thing. So just being comfortable with timing and waiting because even though people may appear to be lucky, Sometimes that opportunity came to them late or they just took advantage when they saw the opportunity when it got hit enough times because you don't always get it the first time an opportunity shows up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about your free will versus the universal time and being comfortable with that. That, that was a really good takeaway. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I want to go back for a second because you did mention being Dash. And so I want you to put on your certified leadership training hat, right? So there's a, a famous video of Dean Dash busting into a, an office meeting, and he wasn't invited, or the, there was the appearance that he wasn't invited. So he goes in with the video crew, and, you know, he's, he's, he's ruffling a lot of feathers, to put it nicely. And then you hear in the video, somebody says, Jay set it up. He set up this meeting. So from a train, a certified leadership trainer, how do you keep your eye on employees that may be undermining your business? <laughs> Man, for that one, it depends on how big your business is and how many employees you have. Like for that one, it kind of goes back to making friends sort of thing. You have to be able to have relationships with your company and be able to manage by walking around. And that's probably one of the best leadership tech even management tips ever is to manage by walking around. And granted, that's going to be hard in this whole COVID crap era, but really keeping touch with your frontline employees and being aware of of the majority of what's going on because you can't sit on your ivory cow all day and CEO and CFO and all this other good stuff and be so darn far away from everybody in terms of sight that you lose touch with those that are on the front lines with the company. So making sure that you take a break from your call office if you have the wonderful call office in your top of the company and getting around those in your company at all levels. What janitor to, to all the way to you and just talking with everyone and learning from them and heck even sometimes you'll even catch stuff eavesdrop or heck even ear hustle by accident and learn some things because that probably could have happened if they and I'm not sure about the whole situation of what that happened they busted in the office because another thing too with Danny's personality he's a no nonsense to wreck a guy so being able to mess with that personality is not easy for some people so that's really my suggestion for that is really to keep in touch with those at all levels of your organization and to always have lunch with those in the organization and getting feedback from them and paying attention to them and keeping your ears open. Because listening is one of the most powerful keys in the leader's arsenal because when you listen, you get to learn what to do, what not to do. And you get to learn some things in advance. And that's even, that's kind of even, a, I guess, in a way, a little bit of art of war strategy of when you hear some, like you're doing reconnaissance or whatever, and you're actually hearing some things, you'd be like, okay, so I know this person is going to be coming here today. I'm going to make sure that I'm prepared for this person. Like security, it's like making sure you're good in terms of security there, too. 
So that way they can keep you abreast of what's going on as well and just making sure that you have ears not only on your head, but also having ears in your organization too. Mm -hmm. And that, that leads to a, a two-part question, continuing what we're talking about with him, is uh, one, how do you deal with companies or leaders that say, you know, this is my management style and people can take it or leave it. And then the second part of that question is, how do you deal with employees when, they, let's say they call you for, they want you to come in for service, for your services, your expertise, and you say something, and then inevitably someone in the back of the room would say, I've been saying that for six months. <laughs> now he says it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've never come across that way. <laughs> Yeah, so for that, that was kind of rough because in this era and for years on end, there's this, this, this thing with the whole new manager. Mm -hmm. And for those who want to deal with that, there's a book by John, John Maxwell I recommend folks to pick up. And it's called How to Read When Your Boss Can't or Won't. Mm -hmm. And that book is a nice pocket sized book, about a good 200 pages. It has all sorts of wonderful tips about managing up because that's something that a lot of folks have to deal with at one point. And that's even, I had to deal with that myself. Now, great, I didn't have no bad managers at, at all in terms of their skin level because they're learning and growing and they're great people. It's just that when you screw up, you just have to be open to realize that, hey, I screwed up here. And some people are as down to earth to being like, okay, I screwed up here. I'm willing to listen. Sometimes, when you're dealing with folks at high levels, especially with the whole man, but seeing that the six months or six years or whatever, and this guy's confirming it, it's a beautiful feeling for both that guy and the trainer. But it kind of goes back to the listening thing of like, okay, so if one of my men has been saying, one of my folks has been saying this, uh, maybe I should give this guy a chance. And managing up is very tricky for basically what you do because when it comes to managing up, you have to be able to be affable and agreeable, but not a yes man. And that's kind of hard to do depending on what it is because a yes man says yes to everything. But being agreeable is like it basically if there's one time this idea, it's just it's funny enough there's one time when basically you had a supervisor who had this idea of like, you know what, I want to do some professional development for staff. I want the staff to do this professional development thing and we call it this uh, learning lab sort of thing. And they're like, okay, so am I pushing? You think I'm? this might be too hard? might be pushing too much? And to be honest, it's like, no. But if we think of ways to making sure that it's accessible for people, like making sure that it's like one hour we dedicated to this one thing, not being bothered by any other colleague and just announcing it to the whole staff and just being like, hey, doing some self-development thing and then reporting back to the manager and just encouraging them with their ideas like, hey, being open to hearing out your boss and giving some ideas of how to make an idea better and then being the salesman for it because that's really a skill that everyone needs is to sell. There's the whole thing of like, hey, I'm tired of people selling me crap, tired of people selling, but at the end of the day, we're all selling something. We're trying to persuade someone with the ideas. Like we're trying to persuade, like, hey, even as kids, we, <laughs> if one of somebody scream or something, be like, no, nope, and then you cry, scream, or probably throw a tip, a fit or a temper chanting until you eventually got it. And sometimes depending on their <laughs> upbringing, you might uh, have something to cry about later <laughs> and you'll be like, I ain't going to try that again. But being able to manage up is a thing. Being able to be agreeable and affable, being able to love for the other people, and then being that front person to give the feedback from the other employees in your team to the person up top so that way you can filter that to them. That way when you're filtering back that same information, you're also making the boss look good and making yourself look good. So that's really just some feedback on that. No, I like it, and, and if, to make it topical, it doesn't sound like that's the case with the mayor, Baltimore Mayor Jack Young, and with uh, uh, Governor Hogan, 
But in some other states around the country, they probably need to read that book, How to Lead When Your Boss Can't or Won't, because there's a lot of divisiveness in each state as to handle this current crisis. Yeah, and people just need to value people more because I think it's probably, I think it was Georgia where the mayor of Atlanta was being sued by the governor of Georgia yeah. over some masks. I'm like, wait a second, how are you going to sue your own mayor? Like, what kind of crap is that? And to be honest, it, it, and that's, that's the thing about 2020, it's really the year of revelation because a lot of people, their, their coats have been pulled and they, their costumes have been removed. And people are showing who they really are. People care more about the dollar than the human life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may be an opportunity for you. I don't know. It, w- it could be. That's why we have these podcasts, right? But I'm thinking of, I, I went to school here in Atlanta, and Dennis, Dr. Dennis Kimbrough was one of the entrepreneurship teachers, professors there. And he's an author. He's w- written many books, if you haven't heard of them. And one of his books is Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice, right? This built off of Napoleon Hill's book. And so he just put it to a different demographic. So I was just thinking how to lead when your boss can or won't is an opportunity for an author to definitely leverage the uh, current circumstances to a fresh new audience. Oh, uh, yeah. The, 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 the book actually was not too old. It actually came out, I think it was, I'm not sure if it was November last year or old this year, but it's actually not even a year old yet. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. And in the fall, you have the new Crappy to Happy Sacred Stories of Transformational Joy. Uh, is that indicative of 2020? Are you being prophetic and knew this was going to happen? And you're going to take the country from being crappy to happy? <laughs> uh, for, for, since it's since I'm a contributing author and not the spearheading author, I'm not going to say that it's prophetic <laughs> because I believe that. Well, the project it was in the works since I think like last December, but it finally got polished later this year. But um, from crack and happy, it's going to be like a phenomenal book. Myself and about twenty five other authors. Uh, contributing stories of how we had moments where we felt crappy and we were able to turn it around, whether it was through a discovery of a hero in the story that helped us overcome a certain obstacle to find our happiness. And my chapter is about basically how my 2012 is one like of an interesting experience. <laughs> that was the first to remember. That was the year people thought we were going to die and the world was going to end, but what really happened was that we lost 24 months. So the <laughs> road just going to that point of where my personal jerk, growth journey began because one major key about happiness and opposite seconds of that growth is happiness. When you're getting better at something, you get more confident. Mm-hmm. And when people are more self-confident, they start to like themselves better. Mm-hmm. And I think people need to focus more on liking themselves a lot more. Mm-hmm. And folks can call it self-love too. Self-love is good, but I think sometimes... People kind of take self love at a little too extreme, so I kind of prefer to call it the self like sort of thing. So that way, you don't love yourself so much that you kind of go off the deep end and go full narcissist with it. So being able to like yourself and actually turn your adversities into your advantages and realize that crappy moments can become happy moments. Like with this whole COVID crack, yes, people have died, but opportunities have, have come because of it. Like, I mean, Myself, I've been doing more virtual summits this year because that, funny enough, that wasn't even a huge thing. It was like webinars a few years ago, but it's like, well, these uh, places are closed. You can't have live events, so let's make it virtual. Be, doing virtual events, being able to have more affiliate marketing opportunities to get some more residual income coming my way, interviewing all these other authors all over the globe and finding out that Nelly Furtado had an older sister that was an author and a yoga instructor. Like, I didn't even know she... I had an older sister and had her on my show a couple months ago and just connecting with more wonderful people around the globe. So not only this wonderful book is going to help you realize that you can turn your adversity into an advantage and turn your crappy moments into happy moments, 
but also realizing that this year, even though it can be rough and it has been rough, and there may be so a lot more ahead, find those pockets of happiness and at least be grateful for them because it's kind of hard to be grateful and mad at the same time because when you really think about being grateful, you can't really be mad because funny enough, there's this one guy and he has a little book called Free about him and his deceased wife because he himself was blind and he was married to this woman who she probably was a size of baby by good three years old but she was probably in her 30s and she had this this bone condition where she was so short and needed a wheelchair. So he was her height and she was his eyes. Mm. Being grateful for eyesight and being at a normal height, like myself, I'm at six foot. And others, they may be like five foot, five foot three or whatever, but being able to have that height, eyesight, being able to have your feet, being able to be healthy, and being able to have a mask too, because that was one thing that this COVID thing happened, forcing people to get masks. And then folks have been able to get more masks and turn that even into a business opportunity of making masks for people. So even though crappy moments happen, will happen and continue to happen, you can still find happy moments to turn that adversity into an advantage. Mm, well said, well said. And the last question is, if I am feeling crappy at this moment because the book isn't out yet, how can I be happy? <laughs> How can I be happy to learn about where to pick up your books in your podcast and to get in touch with you to learn more information? Sure thing, my man. How's it? You the dude, man. You the dude, man. Appreciate you, man. Great interviewer, chill, current. My man has a lot of knowledge, and you're doing some great work, man. For those who want to. Keep in touch with me. Head over to DonBartman.com. If you do, there's going to be a nice pop-up. We have an opportunity to get a free gift called The 21 Lessons I've Learned from Two Plus Years of Podcasting. Now, to any other field, you'd be like 21 lessons in two years of work. Two years? That ain't a lot. Well, when you look at the statistics, especially before COVID, where everybody had this podcast, everybody's doing this podcast now, people tend to pod feed where they upload like five or seven episodes and they just stop, and they're just left in purgatory forever, never to be found, pissing off somebody who finds them like three years later and realizes they don't have any new episodes. So myself, I'm 290-plus episodes in, and the goal is 1,000 in these coming years. And being able to have a podcast that's reached over 50-plus countries across the globe to keep it going, attracting all these wonderful people in my life to be able to give them a platform to get their stories heard, but also to give listeners that motivation to realize that success is tangible. So that's my free gift to the audience. Head over to DonBrabant.com. Put your email in there. You get the free ebook. It's a $47 value because it, it's a lot of pen testing, a lot of battle testing. I was putting that ebook for anyone who wants to start a podcast to learn a bit more about it or even little reminders about what it means to live a nice little life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes, it's definitely been a pleasure, uh, Dom. We we definitely need to stay in touch. And with that said, you have just been tuned to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homeless Perspective. This is Hanza and Dom. Hey, one, uh, let me be the first, if I if I may, to salute you on your thousand 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 episode podcast episode. So congrats, I'm going to congratulate you now in the present moment for that. And, yeah, let, let's just stay in touch, man. I, I think you have some really good energy. I, I see uh, probably bigger, bigger, and better. And how can it get better than this? Well, the sky's the limit. So thanks for making the podcast today. Hey, thanks again, man. Definitely got to stay in touch like peanut butter and jelly, my man. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. You better, you better. Cheers, man.